verse number 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Now he's talking about Abraham here in this context. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Oh, but now they desire a better country. That is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared a city for them. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for the joy of salvation. Thank you, God, that you have allowed us to have this great book, this great Bible, the great Spirit of God, Lord, that illuminates the Word of God to us and helps us along the journey. I pray, God, that you would touch this particular text this morning. Use it for thy glory. Encourage us as your people. Deal with the hearts of the unsaved today. Lord, no doubt. In a crowd there's this size, there could be one that does not know you as their personal Savior. And I pray that this will be the good, glad hour that they get born from above, get born again by the grace of God. And Lord, for us as your people, I pray, God, that you'd let us get a glimpse of that heavenly Lamb. Help us today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Within Hebrews 11... We have what is called the great hall of faith, if you would. And here in the verses that we have read, we have jumped into the middle of the portion of scriptures that is dedicated to a man by the name of Abraham. It's interesting to note there are more verses written in Hebrews 11 about Abraham than any other of the characters. Not saying that he was more important, not saying that the other stories were not important, but it's just God allowed several verses, 11 of them actually, to be written in the context of Abraham's life. There are two things that characterize the life of Abraham everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, he would do two things. First of all, he would build an altar. And building that altar signified his relationship with God. And I want to admonish us and encourage us that every child of God ought to have an altar, a place where you commune with God, a place where you pray, a place where you spend time with the Lord. It needs to be a specific place, amen. It needs to be a secret place. It needs to be a scriptural place where you take the word of God. And it needs to be, it, it, I'll tell you what, it'll end, up being, it'll end up being a sweet place where you can talk with the Lord and fellowship with with him. Abraham would set up that altar and that would signify that would speak of his relationship with God. But the second thing that Abraham would do, he would set up a tent. He didn't have a house. He didn't have a he didn't have a, a mansion. He would set up a tent. And if that altar signified his relationship with God, that tent signified his relationship with this world. In Genesis chapter 12, God comes by Abraham and says I want you to leave the earth the Chaldees leave your family leave everything behind and he said I'm going to make you a great nation you know what Abraham did he sold his house he got rid of all those possessions that he had and he lived in a tent till the day that he died now I want you to think about a tent this morning some of y'all like to camp and go and go camping and some of y'all uh, I like to go uh, primitive camping where you actually stay in a tent God bless you my idea of roughing it is staying at the Holiday Inn and eating at Outback. Can I get us some help right there? That's my idea of roughing it right there. So I say, you don't know how much fun it is. No, and I don't want to know, all right? Amen. God's given us uh, people that can build hotels with soft beds and, and uh, Internet and TV and Outback Steakhouse. Thank God I'm good, okay? Uh, but you know what a tent is? A tent is not a permanent dwelling place. It's just somewhere you stay for a little 
little while, uh, just for a little bit. And you know what? That tent never stays in the same place. And truly in Abraham's life, he was always moving. He was always going from place to place. And well, in our text this morning, it talks about Abraham. And it talks about how he was seeking another country. He was seeking a better country whose builder and maker is God. Everywhere Abraham went, he would build an altar and he would set up that tent. He would build an altar and set up that tent. And you know what he was doing every time he set up that tent? He was, t- hey man, he was telling everybody around him, I ain't going to be here long. I'm just a passing through. I'm not going to be here for a long time. I'm just on my way home. Well, I want to preach on this thought this morning. I just stopped by on my way home. May I remind you that these bodies, Paul calls them a tabernacle. And if you look up that word tabernacle in 2 Corinthians 5, it is kin to a tent. In fact, the tabernacle in the wilderness was a tent. It was a temporary place. It was always moving. Well, in this life, I don't know about you, but we are just passing through. We are headed to a better land. They sang about it this morning. A land where there is no more sin. A land where there is no more sickness and no more sorrow. And aren't you glad we don't belong in this world? But we are just passing through. I want to look at this text this morning about some things about Abraham's journey. First of all, I want you to notice their description in verse number 13. In the first half of the verse, he is talking about, uh, we don't have time to deal with all that. I could, but that's not where my burden is this morning. But I want you to notice what, they're, what are, they are described as at the latter part. There are two words that describe what Abraham was. Strangers and pilgrims. They embrace that. They said, we are just strangers and pilgrims. Now, that word stranger, it means one who is a foreigner. It means one uh, who is from another country. I need some help, amen. And then that word pilgrim means one who only has temporary residence. And so you know what Abraham embraced? He said, you know what I am? I'm nothing more than a stranger. I'm not from this world. And I'm just a pilgrim. I am just passing through. I don't know about you, but the longer I live, I'm not old. I'm 31. I'm new model, but I'm high mileage. Somebody say amen right there. And but the longer I live, I just don't fit in around here anymore. There are things this world just don't make sense to me anymore. It just, I just don't fit in with it. Anybody help me this this morning know what I'm talking about you know when one is a stranger things that means things are strange to them I've never been I've been out of the country before we went to our we went on our honeymoon went to the Bahamas and and I've been to the state of Alabama uh, as far as being out of the country and and uh, I've been to Michigan that's another country amen and uh, sorry, Miss Linda, but I spent two hours in LaGuardia Airport in New York. And I said, goodbye. I hope I never come to this place again. Amen. I know that's not where you're from. Amen. But all them Mets fans and Yankees fans and liberals made me nervous. Somebody help me. All right. And so uh, I, 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 I've been in a lot of places. And, and, and plus, I paid $7 for a little thing of cereal that big in the airport. Amen. But anyway, I, I'm not bitter about it, though. I've got over that. But uh, I, I've been places where they had, had, had strange food and strange things. And I just wasn't accustomed to it. I've even been in some strange churches. Amen to that. Amen. I've just been some places. Uh, somebody mentioned it this morning. Uh, Brother Rick was talking about some strange things that uh, we've seen in church and things that go on. You know what is strange? You're just not used to it. It just don't make you feel comfortable. That's what a strange remains. Well, I don't know about you, but there are some things in this world that are strange to me. I thought about the conversation is strange. You know, in the world, someone who is a foreigner, they're not familiar with the language. If you don't believe that, go to McDonald's. I mean, they're not familiar with the language. They, you, you know, you're trying to order and trying to, and, and, and they're bust their heart. They're doing your best, their best, and you're trying to do your best. There's a language barrier there. You, you're not communicating. You know why? Because they don't understand. I would say English. They don't understand redneck. I don't speak English. I speak redneck, all right? They don't understand that. But you know what? Somebody, you may not understand uh, somebody from maybe uh, from maybe uh, 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 Mexico may not understand, but you get them. You get them in their home country. You get them back where home is, and they understand everything going on around them. How about 
about you, but I hear people uh, uh, all around in the world talking about things and I, I just don't understand. But honey, when I come to the house of God and I hear somebody talk about Jesus and I hear somebody talk about the Bible and I hear somebody say amen and I hear somebody say praise the Lord and I hear somebody say hallelujah, I'm familiar with that conversation. I know what they're talking about. I know who they're talking about. When you go to another country, conversation is strange, but culture is strange. I mean, you know, I never heard of liver mush till we moved to North Carolina. And I wish I never had heard of liver mush. I'm glad I come to North Carolina. I got my wife up here, amen. But, uh, but I never heard of liver mush. Somebody said, what's your problem with liver mush? Two things, liver and mush. Just, just don't care for that, all right? But culture is different. They have different things, and, and you're just not used to that. And I'm telling you, in this world, there's some things that we're just not used to. I'm telling you, killing babies and murdering and sodomy and wickedness, I just can't get used to that. Can somebody help me, amen? Oh, but I'm headed to a land where I am familiar with the culture. What is the culture of that land? It is saying, worthy is the Lamb. Glory to God. Magnifying the Lord. Hey, we're just strangers and pilgrims passing through. The cause in another country is strange. You know, each country have their, has their own cause and thing that they're pressing for. Ah, oh, in this world we're living in, you know what the cause is? Better yourself. Lift yourself up. Please yourself. Gratify your flesh. Oh, but in the country that I'm from and in the country that I'm headed to on the way home, we don't, we don't magnify the flesh, but we magnify the Savior. Their description. But then notice their declaration in verse number 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Now, notice this declaration. Notice a couple things about it. First of all, it is a public declaration. The Bible said they declare. That word declare means to make known. It means to tell explicitly. In other words, that stranger, that pilgrim, they are not ashamed to identify with where they're from and where they are headed. I, I've lived in North Carolina since I was 15 from ages 2 to 15, I lived in Tennessee, but I was born in Hotlanta. I was born in south of Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. Amen. I, and, and I mean, I bleed Georgia Bulldog red and Atlanta Braves red and blue. I mean, I just, I'm not ashamed of that. Amen. And that's where I'm from. I've got stickers on my truck. I got hats. I got shirts. I've spent a lot of money so my boy can represent the Braves and the Bulldogs, all that. I'm not ashamed of that. You know why? That's where I'm from. If this state had a football team or a college team worth pulling for, I would pull for them. But since you don't, I have to relate to my hometown all right but anyway what I'm trying to say this morning is I'm not ashamed I'm not ashamed to walk anywhere around put a Georgia hat on or a Braves hat on why because that's where I'm from that's who I pull for that's who I identify with I, it don't bother me I walk through San, I walk through Neyland Stadium with a Georgia hat on I walk through the swamp in Florida where the, if you ain't culture that's where Florida plays I'll go in it don't bother me I'll stand in New York where Atlanta Braves hat and do the tomahawk chop it don't bother me at all why that's where I I'm from. Well, if I'm not ashamed to do that as a sports fan, how much more should you and I not be ashamed to say I am a born again, Bible believing Christian. I love Jesus. I love the church. I love the Bible. I love, I love everything about church. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said, for it is the power of God under the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But sadly, people want to be ashamed. They want to say, hey, I'm undercover, brother. Don't tell nobody. God don't have no undercover believers. Amen. Amen. And they, they declare it's a public declaration. But then it is a plain declaration. Watch what the text says. They declare plainly. That word plainly means without cunning or disguise. In other words, they weren't trying to fit in with the world. But they were willingly making a public declaration. We don't belong here. 
We are just passing through. Hey, I thank God I'm an American. I thank God he let me be born in America so I could hear the gospel and enjoy the freedoms that we have. And I thank God for this country. I, I believe you ought to stand for the flag. I believe you ought to respect that. I believe you ought to respect uh, law enforcement. You ought to respect the military. I, if we had a president, I respect his office. Uh, of course, he don't even know where his office is. Uh, but anyway, uh, everybody's upset about him keeping uh, classified documents next to his Corvette. And I'm saying the man still has a driver's license. <laughs> That's a threat to national security. Uh, but anyway, uh, all, all, all that stuff, I thank God for that. And even though I don't really like the president, if he is to walk in the building, I'd stand up and help him get up out of the floor. I mean, I would try to do anything I could uh, to respect that office. Oh, but I'm telling you this morning, I don't want to conform to this world. In fact, Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Watch verse 2 now. And be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind in other words just make up your mind I'm not going to go the way of the world I'm not going to go the way of the flesh I'm not going to go the way of the devil but I want to publicly and plainly say I am just passing through a plain declaration a public declaration a passionate declaration they declare plainly that they seek a country they wasn't ashamed of where they was from, and they wasn't ashamed of where they was going. But there was a land beyond the river that they was looking for. Their description. Not only their description, their declaration, but number three, verse 15, just going through the text, note their departure. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. In this departure, notice... Notice two things. First of all, they did not reminisce. Watch the, watch the text. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out. He says, if they had been mindful. In other words, if they remembered where they come from. If they remembered that old life they used to live. They might have been tempted to go back. Where Abraham was from was a place called the Ur of the Chaldees. It was a very, you study out history, it was an advanced civilization. They had running water. They were, some people even, historians surmise that they were on the verge of discovering electricity. They had a lot of things going for them. But Abraham, when he heard the call of God, said, I ain't going back. You know what the devil will do? The devil will remind you uh, of all the good times you had when you was lost and all the good times that you had in the world and say, man, you'll be walking through Walmart and you'll hear a song over the speaker and the devil will say, hey, you remember that party? You remember that song you used to like? Hey, you'll walk by the liquor uh, the liquor store, a uh, drive by it, and the devil will say, hey, you remember when you used to go in there and you used to have a good time? It'll remind you of wickedness and, and things you've done. Well, I'll tell you, the devil's a liar. It was never as good as what he makes it out to be. He didn't reminisce about it and I'm going to tell you don't you believe the lie of the devil don't you go back on your mind and think you had it better living lost I'm telling you you got it better now than you've ever had it they didn't reminisce they did not return he said they, they might have had opportunity to return had they reminisced and remembered the earth of the Chaldees in this context they might have thought you know I miss my house I'm tired of living in this tent. I'm just going to go back. But Abraham said, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Oh, I want to encourage this morning. If God saved you out of something, don't go back to it. Don't go back to the hog pen. Don't go back to the slop. Their description, their declaration, their departure. Number four, notice this in verse 16. You with me? Look at your Bible. Notice their desire. But now they desire a better country. You know why he, he desired a better country? There was a call. In Genesis 12, you read Genesis 11 and Genesis 12, Abraham was an idol worshiper. He worshiped false gods. Now watch this now. He would bow down towards those idols, towards those gods, and worship them, but they never said anything to him. 
But Genesis 12, and the Lord called and un said unto Abram. Here's Abraham. He's been bowing down to those idols. He's been bowing down to those false gods. They've never said a word to him. They've never answered him. But one day God showed up in his life and God spoke to him. And when Abraham heard that God was speaking to him, he said, that's enough for me. I made up my mind. I'm not going back to those false gods. I'm not going back to that. Mays Jackson was an evangelist that traveled extensively the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, he died in mid-1996. Well, it was uh, Jackson's middle name is Mays after Mays Jackson. That's why I carry a red Bible. Mays Jackson always carried a red, red Bible to the pulpit. Had the truck driver special. It was a radio broadcast. Some of y'all might have heard it before. Brother Mays is a great preacher, great man of God. He used to do them trips to, the, to Israel and take people to show them where Jesus walked and, and, and show them the empty tomb and all that kind of stuff. And he said they was on a trip one time and he said he was just kinda, everybody was just kind of tired and complained the food was bad and the room was bad. It was a Baptist trip, so you know there was some complaining going on and, and people just wasn't happy. He said, but there was just one uh, little uh, Vietnamese lady. He said she was just rejoicing. He said everywhere we'd go, she'd be clapping her hands and tears rolling down her face. She'd raise her hands. and She was just worshiping the whole time. Brother May said, I, I'm going to hang out with her. She actually acts like she's happy to be here. And he said, so one day at lunch, he said, I made sure that I set across the table from her and I said ma'am I have noticed that you have so much joy and you have so much happiness he said would you mind telling me your testimony she said yes sir brother May she said she said I grew up uh, in Vietnam and, and me and my husband got married and we moved to America uh, to uh, get better jobs and, and things of that nature and she said I, I brought all my gods with me and she said I had seven or eight little gods and every morning I'd bow down and I'd pray to them and I would worship them and, and that's what all I knew that's all I knew. She said, but one day my husband was walking down the street and he saw some people going to this white building and it had a steeple on top and a cross and he went in that and they invited him in and he went in he said the people were so friendly and somebody got up and began to talk about a God in heaven and, then the, and the fact that God sent his son to die for our sins. He said he left and come home. He said, you've got to go back with me. She said, we went back the next Sunday and they both got saved and got born again. She said, I went home that day after I left church. She said, I got all my little gods out and I picked them up. I said, you never heard or answered one of my prayers. And she said, I threw it in the trash. She said, I picked up another one and said, you've never uh, met my needs. She said, I threw it in the trash. She said, now preacher, he walks with me and he talks with me. And she said, I just can't help but get excited. I'm not going back. God heard me. There's a call. There's a change. Watch what he says. But now... Because he heard that call, it involved a change. By the way, if God ever called you in salvation, there will be a change. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is. Not he might. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a course. He started going that direction. As soon as God called to him in Genesis 12, he started going that direction. There's an elderly man. I think he's with the Lord now. His name was Brother Paul. He's up from the mountains in North Carolina. And he couldn't drive. But he loved going to revival meetings. And I heard LeVon Boatner tell this. He said, uh, he said Brother Paul, he, he'd just walk. If he couldn't get to me, he'd just walk. And somebody'd pick him up. And he said, a preacher friend of mine one day was driving to a meeting. He said, my friend in a car was going to take him 45 minutes to get there. And he said, he's driving down the highway. And look, and there was Brother Paul walking up the road. He said he spooled the window down and said, Brother Paul, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going up here to the revival meeting. He said, well, that's where I'm going. Get in, Brother Paul. We'll fellowship. I'll drive you. And he said, so Brother Paul got in there, an older man with his cane, had his little cap on. And he said, Brother Paul, was you planning on, why was you walking? He said, well, I had a ride, promised to come get me, and they forgot me. And he said, uh, so I just talked to the Lord about it, and the Lord just said, just walk on that direction. And he said, so I just left the house, started walking towards the meeting. And he said, well, Brother Paul, was you planning on walking all the way? He said, no. I wasn't planning on walking all the way. I was just to start that direction. Well, when I got saved, I started walking this direction. And I don't plan on walking all, all the way. But I got a ride coming. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I've got transportation on the way. 
I like what one fellow says, how you going to know when the Lord's here? He's going to blow the horn. <laughs> Amen. Let me know my ride's here. Amen. There's that change, that course. Last of all, notice their destination. Verse 16. But now they desire a better country. That is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. Why? What about this destination? Well, number one, it's a better country. This word better means more excellent. It means it is superior than the one you're living in. Why is it superior? Well, John got a glimpse of that city in Revelation 21. He said, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. Verse 1, I'm sorry. And I saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, by the way, context. This is after the tribulation period. This is after uh, the millennial reign. Uh, this is the eternal reign. He said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, a door for her, her husband. Well, John, what's so good about this new land? He said, well, there's no despair there. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. He said, there's no more death there. There's no more disappointment neither sorrow nor crime there's no more disease neither will there be any more pain there's no more days for the former things are passed away there's no more darkness for the lamb is the light of that city there's no more defilement for nothing shall enter that city that defileth and thank God there's no more devil cause he's been cast in the lake of fire for all eternity I'd say that's a whole lot better than what we're living in down here with all the sin and all the sorrow and all the sickness and all the pain but I'm glad there's a better land where the shades of love lie deep and because I've been to Calvary and because my sins have been washed away I'm a headed for a better land a better country it's a beautiful country he said that is and heavenly all oh, John said it had 12 foundations he said he said it had a wall of jasper and it had a gate of pearl Somebody said, my goodness, where does, a, where does an oyster live big enough to make a pearl big enough to make gates? Billy Kelly said that oyster lived right next to that well that swallowed Jonah. You'll get that after a while. Gates of pearl walls of jasper, a throne, a, a white, great white throne with that rainbow round about the throne. But I'm going to tell you, it is a beautiful country. It is a better country. I don't want to mess you up right here. It's a built country watch what the text says for he hath prepared he is not preparing I hate to bust your bubble but Jesus ain't up in heaven with an nail apron on you're whistling building your mansion hello he ain't well John 14 yeah in my father's house are many mansions they're already there he said I go and prepare a place for you what is he talking about there he's going to Calvary that's where he's going and he was going to Calvary so I'd have a place there. He said, I'll go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. He ain't up there whistling Dixie. And, hey, he might be whistling Dixie. I don't know. Uh, but he ain't up there building mansions with his nail aprons. And he built my mansion next door to Jesus. Give me a, I ain't seen no mansions over the hilltops. And you, we'll sing all that. That's fine. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but help yourself. And all that stuff. No, that city has already been prepared. It is already prepared. You know what that tells me? If Jesus was having to build mansions, that means eventually, he had to say, well, man, if people quit getting saved, I'd, I'd, I'd come back and get them. I got to build another mansion. Got to build another mansion. I've heard them say, praise God, move their furniture in. They got another one saved. That ain't going on. You got something better than a mansion. By the way, what good's a mansion if you ain't going to spend no time there? I mean, you ain't going to be sitting there, you know, watching TV like you're doing now. Come on now, help me. I, I, they might, Steve, they might have Andy Griffith up there. I believe they might have the Andy Griffith show on loop up there, all right? Uh, but and, and, but I, I, we're going to be worshiping. I mean, you ain't going to need nowhere to go take a nap. We goofy sometimes, ain't we? That's what happens when you get your doctor from a song instead of the Bible. Well, I done ruined some people's songs right there, all right? It's already been prepared. They ought to bless you. It's a waiting on you. That city's already been prepared. Apparently, it was already prepared for Abraham. So he's had it done for years. 
He's just waiting on us. And then watch this. It's the bride's country. He hath prepared for them a city. He's prepared it for us, church. Those of us who have been born again. But here's the best part about it. It's a beloved country. Wherefore, it's where my beloved is. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. In other words, it's where, here's what makes heaven great. It ain't, it ain't the walls of Jasper. It ain't the street of gold. It ain't the gate of pearl. I said it the other week reading Philippians 1. Paul said, For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to see my mansion. That ain't what Paul said. To see grandma. I won't see grandma, but that ain't what he said. To see the walls of Jasper and the gate. That ain't what he said. That's all, that's all, you know, icing on the cake. But here's his main point. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. And he said, I'm going to tell you what it is. He said, which is far better. Ooh, I like that word better. He said, it's far better. Now, if you consider where Paul was sitting at when he wrote that, he's sitting in a prison cell in Rome in a bad place. He said, but I've got a better place to go. You know what we're doing this morning? Don't, don't get too comfortable in this world. Oh, did you see what happened this week? No. I really didn't. So I said, well, it was on ESPN. There ain't no sports worth watching to be on ESPN right now anyway. Amen. I, 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 this world's, people, it, it's amazing. It's amazing, church. Sinners act like sinners, and we get surprised. There was four people on the earth in Genesis 3, and one killed the other one. Four people. It's always been bad. It's always been wicked. We just have more devices now to find out about it. It used to be, you know, 12, 4, 10, and 11. And my grandpa would watch the 10 o'clock and the 11 o'clock news, even though the same thing. Something weird about old people. I don't know. He'd watch it. I'm like, it's the same thing, Papa. It's the same. I got to watch it. and Got to watch the news. I'm like, well, go to bed depressed. We act like, and, and some of you live on that news and live on Fox News and you live on Newsmax. It's just so bad. Yeah, it's bad. It's always been bad. But this ain't our home. We're just, we just passing through. They're going to tear the world up. Let them tear it up. He's out a new heaven and a new earth coming down. You know what we're doing? We're just living in a tent. They used to say, and I'm done. Come on, Brother Matthew. They used to say, don't drive your tent stakes too deep. Because just any day now, our Lord is coming. And may God help us to have our hearts and minds focused on that better country, that better land. See Jesus. Now, I hope you're saved this morning. If you're not saved, you're going to miss out on everything I just preached. Church, uh, church, listen to me. Folks, listen to me. Salvation is not joining a church. You ask people, are you saved? Oh, yeah, I'm a member of such and such church. That's not the question. Are you saved? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I repeated a prayer. That's not the question. The question is, are you born again? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? If not, you're going to miss this country I preached about this morning. And I could take another 30 minutes and preach about where you're going. It's, it's hell. And ultimately the lake of fire for all eternity. I don't want anybody to go there. And honestly, I don't want my worst enemy to go to hell. I want them to get saved so they don't have to go there. If you're here this morning you're not saved, I, I'd love to take a Bible and show you from the Word of God how you can be saved. Wouldn't it be awful to be, to be separated from your family, from your mom, your dad, your parents, your children, relatives, friends, because you had a form of God but you've never been born again. You went through the motions but you didn't want to really get saved because you didn't want to embarrass because everybody already thinks you're saved. You better not be worrying about what people think. You better be worried about what God knows. And I promise you in this church, and I can't speak about other church, but I know in this church, somebody coming out here and get born again, they'll rejoice. They'll thank God, hug your neck, shake your hand. Well, we don't want anybody to die without God. Let's stand. You